Welcome to the Crypto Podcast. You can find all our episodes on thecryptopodcast.org. Also on BitChute and YouTube, you'll find the links in the podcast description. I've got four other podcasts, and I'm a podcasting coach. You'll find everything on bio.link forward slash podcaster. Looking forward to this one today because I'm actually building an NFT business. And Derek Gorty, I know he says it a lot nicer than me, is the co-founder of Enshrine. Please welcome to the show. Awesome. I appreciate it, Roy. Yeah, Gorthy, close enough. <laughs> so I suppose, I mean, we're going to talk about your business, but let's let's just tell them about yourself first. Who's Derek? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'll give the intro on kind of the the Web3 crypto space. Um, but yeah, currently currently working in, in the software engineering field, uh, working on a, a, a startup and an NFT marketplace essentially called Enshrine. Um, yeah, I got into crypto, I want to say in 2017, a little bit before the bull market before this one. Um, in college, actually, the context of that was in, a, we were in a, it's like, it, it had a very long name. Let's just call it a big data class. So dealing with a professor that was the head of analytics at Twitter. Um, so massive amounts of data there. He was uh, generous enough to give us a decent budget for the class and so 50,000 spread between you know however many students let's just call it like 30 or 40 students in there and just said you know go use this API service go out and find something and and me and a couple of friends in that class just said and this it seems like the crypto market's kind of heating up let's see if we can figure out you know sentiment analysis let's let's see if we can predict maybe price changes or something based on that um, and then really started just diving head for head first into, you know, researching, you know, looking at white papers, looking at different coins, looking at all that. And just, I don't know, realizing how fascinating just the space is new cutting edge, just an incredible number of ideas and way too much information to absorb. So, uh, been in love with it ever since, uh, kind of turned off that project and have since, you know, kind of stayed up with the trends and then more recently in the past uh past roughly one year is is kind of diving into the nft space and then specifically seeing how you can kind of bring it into the hands of of like your normal person your person that's not currently heavily involved in the web3 space excellent excellent and like the, the company then is there many involved how many uh, partners have you got on the yeah, so we have six uh, full-time partners right now, and then we have a couple of, of part-time members helping out with, you know, legal and, and some of the business side of things. So total of, you know, call it eight people. Okay, cool. No, the yeah. blog, is it you write the blog or who writes the blog that you have for Inch? That is mostly me. I don't, I don't mind writing. I'll get some inspiration late at night and just get through a couple of those articles in one go and come back and revise it later. But yeah, that's mostly me. Okay. And I'll tell you, I'm actually, why I was looking forward to this, well, one, obviously it's the space I'm in, but two, you mm. have a fantastic way of simplifying what a lot of yeah. people find complex. And you've come, like, I went through all the blog, I read all the articles that were on the thing. Mm -hmm. They're actually very well written, but you're able to simplify it. So maybe we might start off because I know I've covered it, but there's always new listeners coming in and everything. Mm -hmm. For the guy that doesn't know what NFT is, you might let him know. Yeah, for sure. I, I really appreciate that. The goal is for all the articles to be, you know, something that I, my, my test is, I say, you know, can my parents understand this? They don't know anything about the space. Any, any concept that I explain, I run by them and I say, go look at this. If something seems too technical, call it out. I'll go and change it. Um, yeah. So the way that I explain NFTs to, you know, family members over Christmas, you get questions about this. Um, is uh, I'm pretty big into analogies in the space. So given the technical definition or the definition of the term, you know, it's a non-fungible token, which just means it is something that is different than everything else. And the analogy would be, you know, if you look at a dollar bill, aside from the serial number and the wear and tear on the bill, roughly you can go to a bank and exchange one dollar bill for another dollar bill, um, you know, take something else completely different and usually go with something that I know that they're interested in. So I don't know if I've, I've used stamps a couple of times. I don't even know if that's a great analogy because some of them are pretty similar to each other. But um, if you look at, you know, the stamp collecting books, each of them kind of represent the same thing. You know, they have 
properties, maybe it's a, a dollar amount, like a, a one cent stamp, a two cent stamp. In the US, we have forever stamps, right? So there are different attributes about that thing. Um, but each one is kind of fundamentally different, even though it might be used in the same way. Um, and then I usually point them to an article on our blog saying, hey, you know, here's in like a thousand words how I would describe it. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answered the question. If oh, not, and, and like you, the blog. <laughs> and you mentioned about the Mona Lisa as well. I think that's actually a great mm -hmm. way of, because some people, they just don't get it. And I mean, definitely what you said there definitely helps. But mm -hmm. excluding the ice cream of the Mona Lisa, which... I mean, I don't know, was that the real one? Because I've heard there's so many of them that they actually have the real one in storage. Right. So, yeah, how do we know? Right, right, right. So with Enshrine, I, I mean, the main purpose is to simplify the complex, well, what people find complex. Everything is, is complex till you understand it, and then it's easy. So Exactly. I mean, you might just explain exactly what you're doing. Yeah, so we, um, we actually started this business actually a little bit over a year ago and the initial idea um we saw uh, there were a couple of sites getting stood up by celebrities mostly in the u.s um i'm trying to remember the name of the specific one doesn't really matter but essentially you would have these individual sites where you know some of some of these actors or athletes or something they would create a set of NFTs that they would announce a drop ahead of time and say, you know, come in and get my headshots or come in and get my pictures of after games in my career that were really important to me or something like that. And we thought, you know, what if we came in and had a service essentially that could go and stand up one of these sites, like a Shopify, essentially stand up all the smart contracts, do everything, you know, accept payments so that they could just go in upload their media and you know we even thought let's just make it white glove tell them you know ask ask them what what do you want the media to be what do you want the nft to do maybe what blockchain give them a couple of options and then just say you know stand this up and there's such an interest in it like it really was that hype period that you could just have people within a week that was kind of the goal within a week be able to stand up a site get every get get everything in there hype it up distribute it out across social media and boom, like you don't have to learn anything about NFTs and you can kind of capitalize this. And then as time went on, we started looking at that. Um, we started noticing this problem where there were a lot of kind of, I, I don't want to say like garbage NFT projects because a lot of them, you know, the people that are creating the- I'll, really I'll good... say it for you. There are plenty sure. of garbage <laughs> sure. NFT projects. Sure. And I mean, there are a lot of people with really good intentions out there. And then there are a lot of people with not so good intentions out there. And it's just very hard to tell the difference to someone coming in because if they don't, if they're not looking at the smart contract that's on the chain or they might not be able to read it because they don't really have a technical background, there's just, you know, it's it's fraught with with issues. And then you also have this other problem of there were so many NFTs getting created that it's like, what is the point of these things? Like there needs to be a point and the sort of the hype phase is really only going to last so long. And then after that, we, we kind of predicted, you know, 99% of the stuff that's out there is just going to go to zero. It might be cool, but there's really nothing keeping it there. And so we, we kind of pivoted and wanted to, I, I mean, bring the real value of NFTs, which is kind of what we've been focusing on for the past eight months, it is kind of repositioning, refocusing on, let's take fundamentally what's unique about NFTs, about the Web3 space just in general, and make that accessible to people that, you know, are, are not really looking at that space right now. So we're looking at, you know, digital artists, I would say, are already kind of on the forefront of that right They're they're already in that that medium and they've done a great job about kind of trailblazing a lot of these things um, but there are a lot of other content creators out there um and, and our kind of thought was you know there's there's uh, actually an interesting ted talk by adam i think it's mossery something like that head of instagram right been around for a long time and he points out like you know, history kind of repeats itself. So if you looked at the explosion of the internet in the 90s, what that really did for content creators is it decentralized and took a lot of the power out of these big, you know, sort of monolith TV 
print radio, like these very large companies that could, uh, I mean, they, they were the, the distributors of, of information largely. You'd have kind of, you know, small town newspapers and stuff like that. But um, the vast majority of, of the media that was getting out there was filtered through a very small, like a very few companies. Um, and then the internet came and boom, you just saw this explosion. A lot of them lost their power. If you look at, you know, newspapers today, uh, you know, there, there, there's a reason why when they don't have that power in their hands. Um, and then lo and behold, you know, 25 years later, we kind of have the same issue with content creators is there's only, there's only a very few large platforms that they're on. Um, and well, there is a bit more freedom, right? Because you can kind of build a brand, you can build an audience on there. You are very dependent on them for keeping that audience and keeping the revenue streams. And that's been very apparent, you know, when uh, we're, we're kind of looking at video game streamers on Twitch, right? As, as the first set of, uh, of creators that we kind of want to pitch this to, mostly because their communities are already used to directly giving them money, which is foreign to a lot of other people that follow people on social media um but yeah you, you'll see when they you know if twitch wants to change their subscription policy which they kind of did lately they can just say you know instead of 30 percent of your subscription revenue we're now going to take 50 percent, and you just took a 20 percent cut because they can and if you want to try I, and leave, I there, read that. Yeah. And I saw, like, I mean, even thirty percent is high. I mean, to take it's very, 50%, it's, it's, yeah, it's that's, very that's high. Sick, and they deserve to lose the income for actually doing that. That's greed, right? It is greed because they are providing a service, something that distributes the media. But are they providing fifty percent of what you're bringing in? Like the content creators are the entire reason that they're there. Like without that, there's nothing to that platform. It's just a platform with no one on it there is no money to be made. And it's the same thing across these other sites. Like TikTok is kind of notoriously bad at this. Like their creator fund is, is kind of a joke at this point because someone will get, you know, 10 million views and they'll look in their creator fund and they're like, ah, it $2 and 50 cents. Great. <laughs> like I can't make a living off this. Um, and all the while these platforms are pulling in, you know, millions and millions of eyeballs and, and being able to sell ads just to everyone. And because they control that platform, they can kind of dictate, you know, th this is how much money that you're going to give. And as soon as they're consolidating that power, it just seems like they're, you know, more and more restrictive. So we, what we kind of saw is that Web3, which is why we kind of call ourselves a, a, a Web3 community engagement platform, we've rebranded from NFTs because it's not specifically nfts it's a lot of different web3 technologies but the decentralized nature of it kind of changes it from the creator pushing content to a platform and then they're whoever's consuming that content connecting to the platform and then being an intermediary to say if you directly create this relationship this financial relationship between the creator and their fan they can up and leave to another platform. I mean, in a world where platforms do accept that, they could in theory just say, I'm not happy with the policies on Twitch. And so I want to take my audience and move it over to YouTube gaming. And so these platforms would have a much bigger incentive to say, you know, we need to build things that are actually useful to our creators because we don't, you know, we don't really hold that. It's not monopoly, but they don't really hold that power anymore and it's probably not something that's going to change in the next couple of years like these things take time but you know how long did it take for the internet from the early 90s when it was kind of a niche thing until the mid 2000s when the internet was on a phone and people just had access to it everywhere like web3 has the potential to do that um so i guess to kind of sum all that up that was a lot of words um sort of what we're trying to do is build a platform that makes it easy for content creators that don't know a whole lot about Web3 technologies and build unique experiences for their fans that can span across platforms. And we don't want to be, you know, the platform that then holds all that power. We want to build something, give them something of value. And then in the future, if we're not meeting those needs, it's, it's their tokens, it's their community they could up and leave. We don't want them to, but it motivates us, right? To say, like, we need to keep 
building things that are of value to them and innovative and, you know, basically motivate them to stay with us. And like you mentioned, TikTok and the other ones. And sometimes when people are trying to build their numbers, whether it's on Google or Facebook, when you actually pay for advertisement, then mm -hmm. your organic growth disappears. And I've had, I've experienced that over the years with right. different businesses and the podcast and everything. And it's like, you know, they're sneaky the way they do it because then you go, oh, I need to keep paying to, whereas right. that's why I think a lot of people will realize that there's, there's people starting to understand this. It's slow, but once they get it, you know, the, their greed is going to, you know, cost them in the end. And uh, yeah. yeah. So like how, um, how do you, what's your feed in for actually doing this? So, I mean, I'm creating mm -hmm. digital art because basically what we're doing is we're, I've got fantastic artists and we're creating digital art with music and something really that an artist would appreciate you know, or an art collector appreciates. And the same with photography, beautiful photography with mm -hmm. sometimes interactive photography. And like, we're then trying to build a community which is kind of what you're kind of doing, helping with the community as well, really. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah, at so the, the end of the day, is... you want everybody to be like supporting each other. And then if somebody kind of says, hey, I've had enough of this picture, they can resell it and hopefully add a profit. Yeah. So it's the question, like basically the, the fee structure, how much we'd be looking to charge. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. I went on a little tangent. Yeah. No, no worries. No worries. <laughs> Just want to make sure I'm not going to talk for five minutes on the wrong thing. <laughs> but um, yeah. So we're looking at, we're still trying to nail down. Like I, I think, we can comfortably say 12%. I think with kind of the updates, actually with the cost of, uh, we're, we're on the Matic uh, blockchain, the Polygon, in the Polygon ecosystem. So that's actually become significantly cheaper for us. Um, so we're trying to get it down to 10% to for the initial sale. And then on resale, um, I guess the caveat there with our platform is we don't allow external wallets for the time being, right? It's, it's kind of how Coinbase has their setup. Like they do hosted wallets. It just makes it a lot simpler when you can control that for the user versus them having to understand, you know, I need to make a MetaMask. I have to figure out how to get crypto into the MetaMask. And now I have to go and figure out where I buy that. And there's gas fees. I don't understand how that all, like that's all a hard thing to do. Like, again, if the bar is, what will my parents be able to do? I'm sure they could do it. They're not going to. Like, they're, they're both smart people, but I know that they're not going to go learn how to use MetaMask and set up a wallet and do all that. So a big part of the issue is that if we're directly taking credit card fees, that's 2.9% plus 30 cents across the board anytime you charge anything to a credit card. That's just a flat fee for us. Um, in addition to that, which is a little bit different than what other platforms are doing is, is and, and kind of one of the other aspects of the platform that I don't think is going to get a whole lot of attention from creators, which like is fine, but people in the crypto space, uh, it, it is kind of a big deal is like, we're focusing on the quality of the NFT. So we're using Matic, we're using Polygon because it is, you know, their, their proof of stake instead of ETH, which is currently proof of work moving to proof of stake. But uh, the fees are much lower. Uh, greenhouse emissions are, are much, much lower. It's like roughly, I'm going to say very roughly, uh, the carbon footprint of sending, I think like one and a half emails or one and a half Google searches. Like it's incredibly small to send this. Um, and yeah, so, so we're on Matic. Uh, we, we take care of all of the, you know, transitioning from you're paying with a credit card. We, on behalf of you, will purchase whatever Matic you need, do everything under the hood, send things. Um, the other key difference is where the media in the NFT is hosted, which is kind of something that not a lot of people look into, but it is a detail that matters. So if you look, uh, and I guess this is a bit more technical for, for how NFTs work, is the entire NFT for the most part is not on the blockchain. Like to store a one meg photo on Ethereum would be tens of thousands of dollars. Like on Matic, it's still a ton of money. So it's not feasible to do that. And it would be incredibly slow to access, you know, even a one megabyte thing. But if you're talking about a much larger file, it's not feasible. So the thing that is on the blockchain is the, is the actual token. And then within the token, you basically have pointers to what we call metadata. So that can be 
attributes of the NFT, the description, any properties that you assign it, whatever you want to go on chain. And then there's a second pointer to the media, like the content, the video, the photo, the audio, whatever it is. Um, and you can really cheap out and make it easier by just saying, you know, I want to put this file on my computer locally or up on Amazon or something. Uh, because that's, you know, to put something on Amazon S3 for a year, it's going to cost you pennies, if that. Like, it's incredibly cheap. The issue is that's not really decentralized anymore. <laughs> and and there, there are ways around that that other companies are looking at. But um, if you don't do it the right way, I can stop paying my hosting bill and whatever that is, is gone. And, and it's interesting if you look into the, like, the Beeple auction if you're familiar with that like the largest nft sale 69 million dollars in christie's uh terms of sale they said you know this is an unknown technology this media we can't guarantee forever that this thing will be up there we're making absolutely no promises to this so essentially what you just paid 69 million dollars for is a file that lives somewhere and there's no guarantee that the thing is around forever so so just all that to into say this, so when yeah, somebody's yeah, yeah, buying ahead. a digital picture, they're mm -hmm. buying it off somebody, whether it's on OpenSea, they go along, they get it. I mean, my understanding was that then you can actually get, get take that information onto your own PC, onto a USB drive, or that you have it physically, that you can use it as you want. But you're saying it's actually that it's stored somewhere. And if, say, the company that you, mm -hmm. even if it's a big company, because, I mean, we've seen the likes of Kodak and big, huge, massive companies go yeah. bust before. So... Basically, all of them just say there was a massive amount on that platform. They would all disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and I mean, the, so the smart contract itself and the token itself, every transaction related to that token, that's all on the blockchain. That's all immutable. That's fine. Uh, everything else, everything else that is not on the blockchain, you would have to look. And there's no standard out there. There's no one saying like, and, and I guess... All that to say how we are doing it is we're putting it on IPFS, which is a decentralized file store, essentially, which is more expensive. Like, it's more expensive to do that for us. But we, you know, if we went out of business five years from now and all that stuff were on Amazon S3 and we shut down, our account goes off, every single picture that we put up there would just not be referenceable. It'd be a broken link. It'd be a 404. Like it's nothing. Um, so if that was, if you really cared about the media on there, uh, tough luck, the blockchain's immutable. You, you can't change that. And there are ways around it. You can basically point at essentially a router. So something that will just redirect you to something else. So under the hood, you could change the location. The router would just change it. Uh, same issue. If that router goes out of service, tough luck, like all these open C has no idea how to resolve that because it's just, it's a broken link. It's gone. Um, so that's more expensive for us. And, and we're, we're trying to guarantee like the lifetime of that as much as we feasibly can. We can't say indefinitely, but we are trying to say, you know, we will pay to have that pinned up on IPFS so that it is referenceable. We have absolutely no control over it after it's up there. And like we are trying to stay true to the decentralized things should stay decentralized. Like that seems like an obvious take, but that's just not what's out there right now. So when you're saying, you know, 12 down to 10%, like just say I'm putting up, say, the digital picture. Mm -hmm. Is it what I determine what it is or is it from the sale and then future sales? How is your whole, what way does it actually work? Yeah. So the initial sale, because we have to put, you know, the actual token on the chain, we have to put everything up on IPFS, get everything hosted. That would be, uh, let's just call it 12% because I don't want to seem wishy-washy on that. Let's just say 12%. Um, secondary sales are much cheaper because we don't have the overhead of like nothing else needs to go up on IPFS. It's just a very cheap call to the chain, which just says now this new person owns it. Um, we still have to deal right now with the credit card transaction fee, but we're looking at, you know, 5%. So 3% of that already goes to credit card companies. We kind of take the rest of that to keep the platform up and running and develop new features. So roughly, you know, 12 and 5%, 
if you compare that to OpenSea, it's kind of hard to say. It depends on how much the gas is, like it fluctuates. There's no set price, but that's kind of the risk that we're taking by guaranteeing that is we're taking all of the risk that the cost to put this on chain is going to go up substantially. Like we will eat that cost if that happens because it's simpler and because it's, you know, if you're a content creator, you don't want to have to care about what gas prices are looking like when you're doing all the stuff on chain. Like it's all very technical and you probably just want to be out there creating content. Like you want to do the thing that you actually enjoy doing. And we'll take all of all, like ter- take care of all the, d- the details, all the nitty gritty. That's what we enjoy doing. We want to make sure that works reliably. You go do whatever it is that you do, like build that community somewhere. So I saw uh, on your blog, and I hadn't heard of it before, lazy NFT uh, minting. But then because yeah. of just getting to different NFT Facebook groups and there's people going, hey, do you want this? Do you want that? You give me your wallet, I'll give you the thing. And then they're mm-hmm. going, send me the gas fees. And it's $150. And it's like, there's yeah. a lot of scamming going on on that. Because people right. assume, hey, you're giving me a free thing. They just assume, here you go. It's yours. But like, because you're kind of verifying uh, accounts as well. You're not going to have that kind of system, basically, that somebody comes in, puts out a thousand things, and they don't pay a penny. Um, and absolutely not, because you can, on our platform, list something. And, and other exchanges do this. Other platforms do this. But uh, there's really not a need to make the NFT before someone buys it. And that's where that lazy minting comes in. Like, if you say, I want to make... 10,000 editions of this 100 meg video with all this information. That's great. We hope that you sell it, but we don't want to go and make 10,000 editions of that thing until it sells. And so it's a concept that kind of holds true to our let's do right by the planet and minimize our carbon impact as much as we possibly can. Like we will make it as soon as someone buys it and the turnaround time for that, like it, it ranges. But when we're testing it out, it's like, five to 10 seconds. It's incredibly fast. And so you're not really going to know that's, that's like a page load time a little bit longer, but, uh, yeah, it's one of those things that it's an implementation detail, but the costs add up if you don't do it that way. And is it done automatically or must the actual seller then do the transfer through the thing? Uh, no, our platform would take care of that. All, All you're doing is selling something. We take care of absolutely everything else under the hood. I'm just curious because, I mean, you mentioned uh, you know, the credit card fees, which, to be honest with you, wreck my head. PayPal, mm-hmm. wreck my head. PayPal, mm-hmm. not only do they charge people fees, but they, their spread is at least 5%. Yeah. Like, in reality, with blockchain, we should be able to cut that out because they're basically yep. milking it. Like, 3% mightn't seem like much, but even when people are buying you know, the Ferrari or they're buying the house mm-hmm. or whatever, because some people actually do have massive amounts on their card that they can do that. Yep. They're still taking 3%. It's not a case of, oh, that's a high amount. I'm only taking half a percent. They're still taking 3% plus yeah. the 30 cent or whatever it is. Yeah, and, and we've looked at the same thing where it's like, if you wanted to sell something for a million dollars, like that, that's a special case. We will not be charging 12% on that because we're not doing 12% worth of work on that, that large amount of money. It's just for the smaller dollar amount ones. And and like we don't want to get the pricing structure too complex because then it, it comes off as like, okay, it seems kind of scammy. Like, why are you fluctuating the rate that you're charging me for these different things? Um, so for the time being, we're trying to keep it simple. You know, on, on our roadmap in the future is like, let's accept crypto as payments so that we can drive those fees further down. Or if you're keeping money in our ecosystem, let's like refund you the cost of the credit card transaction fee because we're not paying that, right? Exactly. So there are things that we can do to drive that down. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of where our our transparency comes in is, is like we'll disclose when you're creating the listing on our site, it's like, this is how much we're charging you. Here's kind of why, here are the benefits that you're getting. And then as we, you know, cause we're, we're still pre-launch, right? After we launch, we can start to look at how do we drive down these fees for businesses that are, you know, if they're not adding value, which credit card processors do add value, right? That that's an easy way to, for people to pay. But if they want to not pay that fee, we'll, we'll make ways 
to like make that happen. Like we, we don't want to pay that fee. <laughs> We're just kind of transparently passing it on because we need to, like, we can't just eat that cost. And like when you're buying say crypto, because I've looked at a lot of the different ones, like mm-hmm. the fees are about 10% or more just for yep. buying that, which yep. is insane. Really. When you think of it, it's kind of, yeah. it's scaring people away. Cause like at the end of the day, everybody's kind of sick of banks in the way that they're just robbing you, you know, we see, mm-hmm. the, you know, the PayPal and the credit card processing companies, but similar with this. Oh, definitely. I mean, if you, I mean, a lot of currency exchanges do that, right? You go to the airport, it's like a 10% fee. Just 25. For exchanging to- I have seen yeah, 25. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, and that's <laughs> ridiculous. So like, it shouldn't be that way. And there will be ways to get it in the future, like get it down in the future. It's just, you know, we're living in a world right now, especially with who we think is going to really be using this is like, they're not going to be, they're not going to have a bunch of money in the crypto ecosystem. They're still going to have all this money in fiat. And so it has to be accessible for them. But as people kind of dip their toe in the water with something like us, uh, they'll start to learn a little bit more. And ideally, there are simple solutions for currency exchange, right? Where it's not a 10% charge, it's something much lower because there's a healthy competition out there. And it becomes easier to kind of get into that ecosystem and pay less, frankly, for using platforms like us. Like we'd love to do higher volume and just charge you less for each one. Um, that'd be ideal. Like we, we want to be giving especially content creators, we don't ever want to be in the position where we're saying 30%, like give us an, a huge amount of money for us just being a platform that you're on. That, that just doesn't make any sense to us. Um, that's, that's kind of what we think is the older business model. And I think especially in, especially in the streaming world where those fees are like 20, 30, 50%, uh, I, I don't, think that will continue. Like I, I I don't see how it could, right? For some of these huge names out there, that's just a ton of money that you're giving away for having such a large audience. And the only reason that you're paying those fees is because you move platforms, like we've seen it with streamers in the past, you move platforms and you'll lose a huge amount of your user base. Where if you're not relying on them for that relationship anymore, the platforms kind of lose that leverage, right? They, they have to be smarter about how they make money and they have to be charging significantly less for, for what they're doing. And like, I mean, obviously I know it's early stages for yourself, but like, I, I like the way you're obviously trying to reduce it as much as possible because you're also conscious that there's plenty of other people out there trying to do the same yeah, thing. And it's absolutely. a case of like, if, if company B is like 50% of your fees, you know, mm-hmm. the, the creators will go, hey, I'm gone. I'm moving across. Like, yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. We, th- we think that they should like, th- yeah. we should be serving them. They should not be serving us. And, and that is largely how, how I see the relationships that creators have with these platforms. They're doing all the hard work. They're coming up with this, this creativity. And what these platforms are doing is creating a very good way to sell ads which is fine, but that's not really valuable to the creator and the stuff that they're trying to do with their work, right? That is good for a platform making money, but I, I don't love ads. I don't know who does love ads, right? Like that's not, that's not for the creator, that's for the business. And, and they're still not really doing the revenue share that we think that they should be doing if, if that is how they approach their business. With OpenSea, because that's the one that I've got experience with. I mean, I've looked at a lot of different ones and I, there's a lot of bots on there because uh, I was mm-hmm. bidding on something. There's a, even, I, I think even the creators themselves kind of upbidding it. Is it like, have you or will you have some sort of system? One, especially to stop the bots, because it's mm-hmm. sad because I mean, at the end of the day, you want to be authentic and yeah. create value for your you know supporters, which in turn, but if people are playing games, there has to like, is sure. that something that you're conscious of? Yeah, definitely something that we're conscious of. And, and we took that into account sort of in how we even conduct our sales. So when we launch, we won't have an auction based feature. Uh, it's only going to be fixed price because okay. that's, if you look at how, let's just call you know, content creators, streamers, like they will have on Twitch, there's like three tiers of subscriptions. It's either call it like, five, 10, $20. And that's how people are engaging already. You're not really ever paying like a variable amount for a subscription. That would be kind of odd. 
to say like this month, it might be five bucks. And then next month it's like $20. And then next month it's 50. Like that, that would be weird to me if you were doing that. Um, and so we're, we're doing fixed price where the creator could kind of adjust that price if they're selling a lot or not selling enough, they're free to do that. Um, and then on the secondary market, that's also going to be post launch because we're just trying to get the platform out there. Uh, so we're still kind of figuring out if we want to introduce auctions to your point, you could make a bot that bids up something. You could have all the tech in the world to say, let's have these, you know, bot busting algorithms, but Twitter has been around for how long and they still have this issue, right? Like bots are sophisticated. It's not an easy problem to solve, but if you do fixed price listings and a creator is buying their own listings, like they could, uh, I don't know why they would, they're losing money on that transaction. So, uh, yeah, it's a difficult problem to solve. I think a lot of it can be addressed just by how people are selling and reselling, or if it's a fixed price versus something else, you know, if it's, if it's a bot buying a fixed price listing, uh, well, how because I, mean, I, I was creator, looking, right? <laughs> like how I was thinking, because I saw, yeah. especially in Open Sea, you you just have enough to do the bidding on whatever you want, and you can yeah. bid on thirty, or probably even hundreds if you want. Yeah. But I mean, the way to overcome that is that you're only allowed bid what you have put aside, and that you can't yeah, pull exactly. it up, and exactly. that like, so that if you are the highest bidder, you can't cancel. It's like your bid is in there. Yep. Unless someone bids above it, then you can take it off. Right. Yeah. So if you're dealing with fiat on our platform and you bid up something, I mean, it's, it's similar to, to eBay. They kind of have that issue. Like you'll have someone come in and say, Oh, I didn't, I didn't mean to bid on this thing, even though I am the max bid, like it is possible, but you also can crack down on that. Like an account will not be able to do that more than one or two times without being detected as okay. They're, they're clearly just bidding this thing up. And so we'll, you know, we'll crack down on that account. We can do Let's check IPs. Let's check whatever to see if we can do like a broader ban if it's a pattern. But um, yeah, it's a problem that we will have to solve. True. Um, but at least initially, we should not have to deal with it. And as we can kind of scale, we'll have the resources to, to grow and address it in, in the way that it should be addressed. And if somebody is on that system, then they're not able to have it bid on different systems. It must be just totally through your own because I know mm -hmm. that one of the guests is not released yet, but basically they, they, they have a system where it's going on Shopify today. Actually, you can go into Shopify and bid as well as being connected to say like OpenSea or whatever, but that's basically mm -hmm. creating another audience. Whereas if you could do both, you know, have on your system and then be able to integrate it with that, it's just yeah. creating a bigger market for you. At the end of the day, everybody wants to actually, you know, get the, the highest price possible. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And, um, and, and part of like what we think our platform is like, what really distinguishes us is, is the integration with other platforms. So it could be on the bidding side, you know, it could be in terms of, um, I guess if we want to talk about, you know, perks, that's another place where you can, you know, really, really dig into how integrations would improve the experience. But yeah, certainly you could do an experience like uh, integration with Shopify, with something else, with Apple pay, Google pay, like all these different ways to pay and sort of distribute that listing that you have, um, in a way that it, it you know, where, where you're not introducing the, the downside of having like a lot of bots on the platform that are making it difficult for creators to like do their business. Yeah. And I mean, that's the way I say it is like, if someone's gone into Shopify and just say it's a picture or photograph or whatever, like they yeah. buy it, you know, it's, it's kind of their system is looking after you. It's protecting you. And it's just, yeah. you know, it's not that it's going to fluctuate and fixed price is kind of better. And that's, I mean, you can't have a, mm -hmm. bid, a bid, a bid for something like that. Yeah. And like, if you're minting, just say one of 50, because everybody's got their own way. I mean, some is like a unique, just one of one. And then they say mm -hmm. one of like, with your system, you can go in and do that. And then if you want to, because sometimes they say like the first one is the most, the better one that you right. could actually, could you actually then uh, withdraw that yourself to not be putting that out for the time being? Is it possible to kind of play around with things like that? Yeah, you definitely could. Uh, the approach that we're taking, because because we thought of that, it's like, would when you're creating a listing, of a hundred, do you want to reserve, say, you know, one and a couple, whatever numbers yeah. that you think are lucky or something like that? Uh, could you just reserve that for yourself and kind of keep it? And and the conclusion that we came to is like we want 
fundamentally we want creators to be on the same footing as their their fans like we yes they created it but also the principle behind it is that you shouldn't really be able to reserve editions one through ten if you're selling a hundred unless you want to buy it and and compete with with your other fans out there um but yeah you wouldn't be able to just reserve it and and keep it which is something that you can do on other platforms but if you want to keep a good relationship with that community i think that transparently looks kind of like a cash grab if you're saying i want edition number one of all of these it might not be like it it, it might not be but you could also say i think it's going to be worth a lot more money in the future and so i'm just gonna i'm gonna hold on to it yeah but even if you kept not one because i mean you're right there like that's really being but like the way i see it is like buying your own stuff is kind of a bit strange but by having it on your platform which in turn Mm -hmm. is kind of a marketing so just say that i've done 50 eventually like people do go in and check see what you've got which in turn when they hit that they'll see the whole kind of which is a marketing tool which will help the other people so that's the way i kind of look at it yeah it definitely is so and and how we kind of represent it a couple of other platforms kind of do it this way but we are kind of taking a more profile centric approach so if if i'm a creator you'll be able to see what did i make what have i collected and then if you want to show what have i liked you know you can show that you can also toggle that off so it would be a way if if you're a creator kind of having one single place for for your fans to go and then for your fans uh you can go to their profile and you can go to collect it and you can see oh you bought all 50 of these things that I have released and I can kind of transparently see it right there. And maybe you're a super fan and you bought five of each of these things. I, I could see that on the platform. And so it's very transparent between creators and their fans. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I guess if it would be a marketing opportunity for the creator, if their number one fan just said, look at all these cool things that I bought, you go ahead and buy some like that. That is something that they could do. And like, if, for example, because I mean, nobody knows what the price, the market determines the, you know, <laughs> supply yeah, and demand. Exactly. But just say, if you put it out of the, let's call it a hundred bucks, and then you see, mm-hmm. hey, this is flying. I can go yep. in and modify it to 200 bucks. Then uh, is this halfway true? Can you, is that possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you definitely could. Um, yeah. And you, you can raise it, you can lower it. You know, we, we want to strike kind of the balance of, we don't want total control over the creator. Like they can do what they want. Um, we, to a reasonable degree, want to cut down on, you know, predatory practices like that, where you would say, oh, I, I sold out a hundred of these at a dollar. And then I raised it to $50,000 when there's one left, like we would show you what each person paid for this thing. So you could go in and say, oh, this, okay. It's not clearly a hundred people have not bought this for $50,000. Um, but yeah, the creator, like they they have a relationship that they want to maintain with their fans and if they want to do things that are shady or something like we'd prefer that they did not do that but they do have the freedom to do that that's that's kind of a tenant of web three is like you know you make your own bed right like you are free to make these choices if you want to but you know we do kind of we do trust that people in good faith will not do things like that yeah, but yeah, but I mean, the beauty of blockchain, you can actually go in and check all this yeah, stuff and you exactly. go, hey, what's going on here? Like, because I mean, yeah. that's how I was able to see a lot of fraud on OpenSea. It was like, everything mm-hmm. is traced when you're going, hey, this guy never bought anything yet. He's bidding on 20 of these things. They're bidding yeah. between themselves and everything. And yep. w- with the creators then, like how do you validate them then that are coming in like that they're, you know, have you got a system for onboarding? Genuine. Yeah. So um, initially we are, it, it, it's by you know, access, access only by you have to contact us, right? You'd have to be on a limited list. We're mostly doing that for content moderation purposes. Like it's, it's difficult to kind of police content on your platform. And you've seen like, you know, meta Facebook has invested millions of dollars, potentially billions of dollars into moderating their content. And there's still issues with that. Um, so for the time being, we're a small team. We, we want to keep it a good space, right? Where there's not fraudulent things out there. And so we would validate um, individually each one of these creators. And then we also kind of put an emphasis on you will link, you can basically just link social accounts. So if you're saying, if you say that you are someone, you should be able to link your 
verified Twitter account, your Instagram account, and these other things. And so we can kind of verify, you know, verify it that way. And if it's someone really, really big, we'd probably just want to hop on a call and say, is this you? Like, can we double check that this is not someone else impersonating you? Oh, that sounds very exciting. And yeah. um, so, I mean, definitely what I'd like is maybe in three months or so when you're actually moved forward that we come yep. back again, because obviously, you know, you're going to be modifying as, as you go along, but it sure. looks like you're looking for a win-win situation so that you get the creators and you want them to stay on board. It's not a case of a, a Twitch situation. Give us 50% of your money. Like right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you exactly. Might... I'd be happy to be back on. Then. <laughs> you might let people know how can they get in contact with you. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I are you gonna put links down in the yeah, description? Yeah, yeah, the audio on the video. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So go ahead and check those links out. Uh check us out on our website. It's enshrine.io. Um, we're on you know Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, if you wanna if you wanna visit us there. Um, go ahead and check us out there. And yeah, we have contact forms on the website. If you're a if you're a creator, if you're you know, an NFT fan, if you're an investor, whoever, uh, if you like the podcast, feel free to reach out. I mostly am the one that moderates that. So, um, you know, I, I like to check it quite often. Um, but yeah, definitely get into contact with us. And then we'll be posting kind of regularly as we're approaching our release date, uh, sort of solid dates when, when we get to that point. And so you're actually uh, trying to get and look for investors as well? for funding? Um, You know, we're, we're a team of people that have been in tech, I think it's collectively for like 80 years. So we are in a privileged position right now to be able to, to self fund and, and kind of do this on our own time. Um, especially considering like the macro economic en environment for startups and web three startups right now, it's kind of a tough time. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely talk to you, but by no means is that something that will stop us from releasing. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much, Derek. And I look forward to getting you back again. Definitely. Thank you so much, Roy. No problem. So that's all for the Crypto Podcast. You'll find all our episodes on the CryptoPodcast.org. As mentioned, we're on BitChute and YouTube. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, five-star rating, share with your friends. And if you're interested in starting a podcast, go to bio.link forward slash podcaster. Until next week, take care.